Yeah, I'm good. Lord, you're good. You're wonderful. And you're kind of terrifying, too. Because you're the author of the universe. You're the author of truth. And you see right through us, right, right into our deepest soul. And you see the fallen nature there. Lord, thank you that we, you don't leave us there. But you put your hand on our shoulder and you say, fear not. And I thank you for that. I thank you that the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. And it helps us to own our crap. It helps us to be real. It helps us to come before you with boldness. Because as you say, fear not, you say, I already paid for that. So we don't have to beat up ourselves because you already took the penalty and there's nothing we can do to improve that. So Lord, as as we begin to, to sing songs to you, through your power, give us the ability to sing in your spirit as you give us power to overcome because we can't on ourselves overcome. There's never a time we will not desperately need you. And I thank you for that. Lord, please be with Sean as he delivers the word. And if there are words uh, that are on his page that you don't want, uh, shut his mouth. And if there are words that as often happens that you want that are not on his page, uh, put them in his mouth. And give us ears to hear and hands that would do, and feet that would be ready to do those things. I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.
Taste and see. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see.
Thank you, Lord, that you love us. That, that is one of the major truths in the universe is that you love us. You are not some distant God who is waiting to wipe people up, waiting to hit them with a lightning bolt and turn them into a grease spot, but that you actually love us. You want to restore that relationship with us. The Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, so do we. That without your Holy Spirit, we are enemies of you. But with your Holy Spirit, we want to be reconciled to you. Lord, so now we come, we bow down, we submit. Like the dog licking the hand, we worship you to show our submission to you, our affection for you. And Lord, we put our hearts and our wills and our ears at your service right now so that we can hear from your word, that redemptive word that can wash us and cleanse us and renew our minds, strengthen our spirits, and give us power, power to do your will, that we can become your hands and feet, that Fort Wayne will know that there is a God in this city that is not idle, that he is working. And Lord, thank you for growing us. Thank you for taking us down to practically nothing and then growing. I pray that you would give us the sense of servanthood, that we would serve you however. Here we are, Lord. Send us. Touch that coal now to our lips to purify our lips so that we can serve you. I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right, so uh, I, I don't want to like brag on anybody but God, but I'm going to brag on God through the worship team today. <laughs> um, did you guys notice like Chris using like three fingers on the bass, like like Steve Harris over there, like get some like Iron Maiden going on in the middle of the middle of worship? That was pretty awesome, and uh, fantastic job, guys. That was great. Um, uh, and you'll notice this too that we're we're doing teams now instead of like all the people, the worship team, all at one time. So we're going to break it down to smaller groups of people on stage, but, but rotate them. It keeps the sound fresh. I mean, the word says to sing a new song. And sometimes we take old songs and we give it this different flavor, and it kind of breathes new life into it. So that's what we have going on here. And we're going to continue doing, doing that. I want to encourage you when you show up to be ready ready to worship. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, full disclosure, I wasn't ready at all. And I put on the Altar Boys on the way here, which is like an old school uh, punk rock band from the 80s. Probably the first worshipful punk rock band, <laughs> the, at least the first one that I ever encountered. And that kind of brought me in. So, you know, listen to something that kind of gets you fired up and ready for worship when you get here. All right. So here we are. We're in uh, Mark chapter 3, trucking right along. We've been in, been in Mark now for uh, three months, and we're in chapter 3. We're moving at a snail's pace, the pace of an iceberg right now. Um, again, on paper, this is terrible, so I don't know what's going to happen during, during this lesson, but let's dive in and see what happens. All right, Mark 3, 20, verses 20 and 21. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again. See, Jesus can't get away from the crowds. And it wasn't, I, I jokingly said he was kind of like a rock star. It was that he wasn't a rock star. I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clarify what I said before. I, I didn't mean that he was a rock star, like he was all puffed up, like he was pompous, like he thought he was like all that. He was actually, in many cases, trying to get away, <laughs> and he couldn't do it. So he goes home, and the crowd gathers again. And, they, and it says they were not even able to eat. That's included in there to let you know that he was so annoyed and bothered by the crowd. He said, I can't even eat with this going on. This is nuts, right? So verse 21 says, when his family heard this, they set out to restrain him. Okay, because he's just like, it, so much chaos is going on. It, they set out to restrain him. And then the word says this, because they said he is out of his mind. Now, wouldn't you think that the family of Jesus would know what's going on with Jesus? Wouldn't you think that? Wouldn't you think, I mean, his closest companions, of course, were the 12 disciples, but also his family. They grew up with him. I've jokingly said they, you know, they played board games together. They, you know, they, they watched Netflix together. They played kickball together. Of course, joking. I'm putting it into modern context. But they knew him. 
right? They knew him intimately, right? So let me stop right here, probably getting ahead of myself. But let me ask you a question. If your own brother or sister came to you and said, hey, I just, I just got to let you know that I'm, I'm God, you would probably be picking up the phone and calling the asylum and, and, and having them suited up for a you know, nice little rubber room. Right? You, you'd think they were just nuts. So I go, what did you just say? You're God? Now, that's, cra- that's crazy talk. What, what do you mean you're God, right? And, and like, I just got you out at third base. You're not God. If you were God, that wouldn't have happened, right? So this is, this is why his family is like, he's clearly out of his mind. He's clearly nuts. You know, we appreciate all the, you know, good things you're doing, but you're not thinking straight. You, you're thinking you're more than who you are. So when I said Jesus was a rock star, no. His family thought that he was acting like one. Like, the, look at what you're doing. You're stirring people up. You're going out and, you know, with this ministry, and you're stirring all these crowds up, and you're, you're, all this stuff's happening. Jesus wasn't gathering crowds for himself. Not for an ego trip. He was gathering crowds for the Father. He was pointing directly to the Father in everything he did. The ministry of Jesus in Galilee certainly drew attention of a lot of people. Multitudes followed him everywhere. Jesus' life was endangered by the crowds. There were moments where there were so many people. It was like, you know, you see those videos of the Beatles where they like have to hurry up and run away because they're going to get trampled, right? There's too many people. It's like if, I don't, you remember the, the Who concert where, where people got trampled and actually died trying to get into the concert. Jesus' life was endangered in the same way. And the house that he was staying at was now besieged by this massive crowd, and they couldn't even, they couldn't even eat because they couldn't stop and take the time to do it because they're, they're in danger. They're in trouble. So it also drew the attention of his family, as I said before. They were concerned by what they heard, and they, they sought to basically take him into custody, and they questioned his sanity. <laughs> Like, he's nuts. Why is he saying this? Why is he saying these things about himself? This is crazy. So the reaction of his family, I think, is interesting, but I, I also think it's understandable. I don't know if you agree with me or not, but I think it's, under, under, it's understandable. If my brother told me that he was God, I would think he was nuts. But before we consider their reaction let's, and how they later responded to Jesus, let's review what is revealed in Scripture about the members of his family. Let's start with Mary. Now, we know... Actually, quite a bit about Mary, really. I mean, there's quite a bit of information about her. Um, this is obviously his birth mother, a virgin until Jesus was born, uh, visited her cousin Elizabeth, gave birth to Jesus in Bethlehem, took Jesus to Jerusalem when he was 12 years old. Um, she was present with Jesus at the marriage in Cana. She saw Jesus when he was teaching. She was present at the cross, and she was committed to John's care. You know, Jesus told John, "Take please take care of my mother. Um, and she was with the disciples in Jerusalem following his ascension. So she has been right there in the middle of it, the core of his entire life, the core of his entire ministry. And would we expect a mother to not be intimately involved with her son? I mean, let's not forget, he's God, but he's also in human form, so he is still Mary's little boy. If you ever saw Passion of the Christ, the moment in that movie that tears me up more than any other moment is when Jesus falls and the camera pans to Mary. And the expression on her face, you know, she sees her son. It just, Jesus is not my son. He's not your son. But you can relate to that. Even if you don't have kids, you can relate to what that would be like to, to see that happen. So let's talk about Joseph. Joseph is his adopted father. I think he's one of the most incredible men who have ever lived. And I really don't know that much about him. But I think he's one of the most incredible men that ever lived because he had every right and reason to say, um, I'm totally not marrying this chick. I'm out. Deuces. Okay? He had every right and reason by Jewish law, by the customs, by any level of morality to say, I'm not doing this. But it wasn't a morality that was a human invention that he was following. He was following the righteousness of God. He understood especially when he got a messenger who came to him. He understood that what was about to happen to him in his life and in his beloved's wife, that what was about to happen was they were going to raise God in human form. And he understood that. So he had to go against conventional wisdom. He had to go against the culture. He had to go against Jewish law 
and do the right thing. You ever had to do that? You ever had to go against everything that you've ever known and do the right thing? That is not easy. So here's Joseph. He's a descendant of David from the house of David. Uh, he took Mary as his wife and didn't know, um, he, he did not truly really even know Mary that well until Jesus was born. He was from Nazareth. He was enrolled at Bethlehem, uh, presented Jesus at the temple in Jerusalem. Let me rephrase that. He knew who Mary was, but he didn't truly really have a really good grasp on, on who this woman really, 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 really was until after Jesus is born. Then he sees the reality of, wow, I just scored the most incredible woman on the planet, you know, it, it, pretty much, you know. And so he also presented Jesus at the temple in Jerusalem and then returned to Nazareth. He fled to Egypt, later resettled in Nazareth, took Jesus to Jerusalem when he was 12 with Mary. Um, and Jesus was blessed to be, to be born of a virtuous woman, but raised by a just man. Let's talk about Jesus' siblings. He had some brothers. James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. All four members, or all four are mentioned um, on one occasion. In Mark 6, 3, they're all mentioned, and in Matthew 13 as well. But they, they accompanied Jesus and his mother from Cana to, to Capernaum. And later with Mary, to, they, they sought to see Jesus. You know, when they show up and, hey, your, mo your mother and your, your, your brothers are here. And he, of course, tells them that you're my family. He tells the disciples that. He had uh, two sisters, Mary and Salome. They, there were at least two sisters that we know of. Uh, no, the names are not really given in the scriptures, but Christian literature gives the names Mary and, and Salome um, in the, I can't even say the word, the proto-evangelism of James, the gospel of Philip, uh, Epiphanius. And, you know, so we, that's how we know their names from other historical books, but not necessarily from scripture. And so Jesus was blessed to have a number of siblings. So when we talk about the family looking at him like he's crazy, it wasn't just one or two people kind of coming up with this. They're all kind of looking at each other like, what is he doing? What is he talking about? So his family had some misgivings about him before the resurrection. Again, we know from the passage today that some people thought, some of his family thought he was crazy, but they thought he was out of his mind, and they endeavored to take custody of him to protect him. He's like, this has gone too far. We got to get him away from these crowds. We got to get him, you know, because they're going to kill him. Not that they were, they were trying to kill him. They're trying to get to him. But he's in danger. His own brothers didn't even believe him. Look at John. His brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea so your disciples can see your works that you're doing. For no one does anything in secret while he's seeking public recognition. See, they didn't understand it. He wasn't seeking public recognition. If you do these things, show yourself to the world, for even his brothers, for not even his brothers believed him. They didn't believe him because of his methods. His methods didn't make sense in their culture. And guess what? His methods don't make sense in this culture. One of the reasons that this room here today is not completely filled with people is our culture doesn't believe him. They don't believe his methods. They don't believe what the scriptures say. More importantly, they just don't believe in him himself. I've had people in the past six months tell me that they don't even believe that Jesus existed. I'm like, what about all these corroborative writings outside of the Bible? Why you're dismissing all these other writers? People that didn't even like him, people that were against him, were talking about him. Now, whether he's God or not, okay, you might be able to argue that point based on those writings, because those writings clearly do not say that he was God, but they also clearly say that he existed. The fact that Jesus existed is not a debatable fact. It's just not. It, you're, you're either ignorant, and I'm using the, the true meaning of ignorant, you don't know, or you're hostile. Those are the only options. To say Jesus doesn't exist, you either hate him or you just don't know. That's the only options. We know that he existed. His brothers didn't believe just like so many people in our culture don't believe. They, they go, okay, we know that there was this first century prophet, teacher, good guy, seems to be a good guy, says some wise things. He's nice to people. Yeah, be like Jesus, that's cool. That's cool. The real famous quote, you guys have probably heard this before. He's either Lord, or he's a lunatic, or he's a liar. 
Those are the options. He can't just be a good teacher. He can't just be a righteous man because a righteous man would not claim to be God. A righteous man doesn't say, worship me. A righteous man does not do that. A righteous man does not, does not travel around telling these crowds, look, what you need to understand is if you put your faith on me. Now, we use the phrase in me. He used the phrase on me. Put your trust on me. Let me carry that. Let me carry you. Let me take away your sins. Let me carry the very burden that you have. A righteous man doesn't do that. Because let's break this down real quick. He's either Lord, which I believe, lunatic, which his family right here is believing at this moment, or he's a liar. Well, we know he's not a liar because we also have witnesses of his burial, his resurrection, his ascension. We have witnesses, eyewitnesses that were right there. They saw it happen, and we have this accounted in Scripture. And to date, no one's ever been able to refute that. No one's ever found anything that, that, that takes that, those facts away. Here's the reality. 500 people witnessed Jesus preaching after his resurrection. Now, in, in Jewish writings, they count the men. We're going to cover some material we covered before. They only count the men. Most men at a very young age and most women at a very young age in this culture would get married. You're basically a spin, spinster by the time you're 17. Okay, So they get married very, very young. If you get married at the age of 17, let's just be raw and honest here. What's going on with 17-year-olds? Raging hormones. Now, what was the opportunity for birth control in the first century? Not very good. So when these husbands and wives who were very, very young, do you suppose they might have had a couple kids? They had a litter, Chris says. Right. So when they say 500 people, let's, let's be real conservative in our figures. 500 people, most of which would have had wives, so there's roughly 1,000, most of which would have had at least one child. Now we're talking 1,500 people witnessing Jesus preaching, not 500. We say 500 because that's what Scripture says, because they only count the men. Now you got 1,500. It was probably a lot more than 1,500 people that saw Jesus preaching. These people leave that sermon, go out into Jerusalem, and start talking about it. Show me the document that refutes that happened. Is there one? We don't have it. We don't have it. Show me the writing of any historian of the day who said, yeah, these clowns were listening to to this guy they thought was Jesus, but Jesus is dead. And then they went out into the town and talked about it, and some of them even wrote down the synoptic gospels, and, but it was all made up and it's all false. Find me that document. Is, does that document exist? No. Do you know where those documents started? Fourth century. Well, wait a minute. So we don't have any eyewitness accounts? We've got 400 years later, people started going, mm, maybe not. Nope, sorry. Too late. Too late. Okay? You had 400 years to refute it. You didn't do it. No. We're not buying that. And do you know where most, most of those documents have come from? What age? What years? Within the past 50. Within the past 50 years, people have started going, yeah, that's, that was all made up. That's not true. How can you even begin to make that audacious claim? I think it's far more audacious to, to 2,000 years later say, no, that wasn't true, than it was to believe what Scripture says. 2,000 years later, you're all of a sudden going to make up something? You're going to, like, rewrite history? Well, look at our culture right now. They're really enjoying their rewrite of history, aren't they? It's just where we're at. So his brothers didn't believe him. They, they, they taunted him. In this passage, I don't even picked up on that. Leave here and go to Judea so your disciples can see your works you're doing. They're taunting him. They said, come on. Do it our way. Do it the way we want you to do it. Don't do it your way. Show yourself openly to the world. When their brother, when their brother claimed to be the Messiah, the Son of God, I mean, who can blame them, right? If that's your brother and he's saying that kind of stuff, you might taunt them too. You might taunt your family member that makes a claim like that. So then after the resurrection... 
Jesus appears to James. He appears to his brothers who became disciples. If your brother dies, is resurrected, and says, remember when I told you I was God? I'm in. 100%. I'm in. I believe you now. Okay? I don't, whoa. Yes, you are. I'm in. Okay? Look at Acts, Acts 1, uh, verse 14. All these were continually united in prayer, along with the women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. They were united. They believed. So James becomes identified, identified as the Lord's brother, a pillar in the church, likely the author of the epistle of James. I believe he is. You know, there's some question, but there's always a question. Uh, James was kind of like the first pastor in, in Jerusalem. He was kind of the first guy to go, all right, I'm going to keep these people organized and together. And, you know, I like that word organized because I love how people say, like, I hate organized religion. I'm like, like, man, I've never been to a church that was truly organized. Have you? Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> if they were organized, we'd be get a lot more done. But so that that's what cracks me up. So, but he was the first one to kind of go, "Hey guys, you know, let's stick together, right?" So you got James, and James was martyred by being thrown from the pinnacle of a temple. How do I know this? Because Josephus wrote about it. Again, hostile writer to the gospel was not into the gospel. He talked about Jesus' brother James being thrown from from the pinnacle of a temple. That's how he was martyred. He died proclaiming that his brother was God. That's a switch. Joseph, little known, uh, there's little known about him, but evidently he was a traveling missionary. I, I don't have the verse up there, but 1 Corinthians 9, 5, if you want to look it up, it talks about all of them traveling. Joseph, Simon, little known, like, like, likely a traveling missionary. Judas was believed to be the author of the epistle Jude. Okay, that's, that's what is believed. I, again, tend to believe that that's true because it seems to line up. Uh, Jesus' resurrection from the dead um, overcame any misgivings by his brothers. The doubt that they had was suddenly undeniable. Probably the reason why you're sitting here today listening to this whole thing is there was a moment in time where you said, I, I can't deny this anymore. You're either, you're either sitting there saying, I can't deny that Jesus is God, that Jesus is real, that Jesus wants to impact my life the way he impacted his own brother's lives. You're either saying that or you're saying, I want to know more. Or your parents made you come here. One of the three. Hopefully the third one isn't even a part of it. Hopefully what's going on is you want to get closer to Jesus the way the crowds wanted to get closer to Jesus. Can you blame the crowds? I don't blame the crowds. I also don't believe his, blame his family for not believing in him at that moment. But I got to give them credit that when they saw the empirical evidence of the risen Christ, and they, when James went to his death for his brother, I got to give him credit. Okay, we're going to wrap this up short one today so the worship team can come back up. The initial unbelief of some members of his family is completely understandable. Mary never doubted. She alone knew the truth about Jesus' birth. We don't have any record of Mary having any doubt ever about who he was. But the doubt of his brothers, I think, is normal. It's normal. We should probably lay off the brothers. I get it. Their initial unbelief and their eventual faith, though, can be thought-provoking. They did not believe despite the miracles of his ministry. Do you, do you realize that? When did I say they started believing? After the resurrection. So many people were coming to faith because they saw Jesus heal the blind, raise the dead, stop a woman from bleeding, fix a broken leg. They saw these miracles of Jesus and they, they came to faith. Not the brothers. The brothers didn't come to faith until they saw the risen Christ. Then they came to faith. Okay, a little late in the game, guys, but you made it. You're there. They didn't believe despite those miracles. Yet later they chose to follow, follow his apostles and suffer for his cause. The reality is we're going to live in a world that is hostile to the truth. The world likes fake news. They embrace it. Don't believe me? Go to any checkout counter and look at the magazines. 
Tabloids would be out of business if we didn't embrace falsehoods. There wouldn't be any. Ecclesiastes tells me there's, there's nothing new under the sun. People back in Jesus' time liked falsehoods too. They didn't like the truth, but there were some people who did. There's some people who said, I, I believe in the risen Christ. I believe in Jesus before his crucifixion and resurrection. The transformation of skeptical members of Jesus' family is easily understood. Okay, I don't have to go on any more about that. He's risen. Okay, I'm in. If, in fact, Jesus did rise from the dead. So what does this all conclude with? You have these doubters, his own family, and went, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. And then they're dying for him. I would say that's just one more reason, one more fact, one more proof that Jesus did raise from the dead. One more bit of evidence to suggest that Jesus is God. One more bit of evidence to suggest that his ascension was real. One more piece of evidence to suggest that Jesus is alive. Thus, the family of Jesus serves as a powerful testimony to the resurrection of Jesus. Here's the thing, though. That was his immediate family. But look at us. Former dogs of society, Gentiles, who are now adopted into the family of God. I'm adopted in, like, real life. Like, my family adopted me when I was an infant. So I know what that's like to be an adopted kid. I also know what it's like to have Jesus himself adopt me into his family. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for that adoption. Thank you for some of the proof that we have that you are real, some of it kind of funny. We can laugh a little bit and giggle a little bit about the way your brothers viewed you as their brother, but we can't laugh and giggle about how they saw you as the Messiah. We can't laugh and giggle at how so many people still reject you as the Messiah after so much proof and so much evidence. But you did say, you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. Then you'll find me. Jesus, you said that we would find you, but the reality is that you are the one who seeks and saves. You found us. I don't know that in and of ourselves we would have kept continuing to seek to find you had you not met us right where we were. Thank you, Jesus, for rescuing from ourselves. I, I just ask that you would empower every single person in this room. Holy Spirit, empower every single person in this room to do the same things. You said we'll do the same things and even greater. Your 12 disciples impacted the world, changed the course of human history. Imagine what we could do if we got up off the couch. Imagine the impact that we could make on this city if we reached out into this city. Imagine the impact we could make, not in and of ourselves, but because the most powerful force in the entire cosmos chooses to dwell inside of us. Because the most powerful force in the entire cosmos took the cross and paid the, the penalty for sin once and for all to tell us die. It is finished. Jesus, today we, we ask that, that you would forgive us of, of all wrongdoings. We know you've already done it, but we're asking anyway because your word says to. We confess that, that we are not, our identity is not found as a sinner, but that we are sinners. Not our identity, but in our behaviors. And we confess that Jesus, that that our identity, our identity is you. You are our identity. And thank you for rescuing us from, from the fires of hell. Thank you that when we screw up, when we mess up, when we, all that stuff, that, that you don't throw us out. We have a tendency to throw ourselves out. We have a tendency to throw each other out, but you don't. Thank you, Jesus, for, for just being that ever-present help in time of need. We pray that, uh, that today that you would light a fire in our bellies that, that would just burn and burn and burn until, until we're 
no longer complacent. That we would go out into this community, we'd reach out among our friends, among our coworkers, and love them beyond our abilities. And sometimes, sometimes when we can't communicate clearly, when we can't, we just can't communicate the love of Jesus properly, then give us the words to say. Lord, thank you for, for being here today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you.